welcome to our fourth Meet the Candidates Night for the East Brunswick Board of Education. I would like to start this evening by having our EBEA Government Relations Chair, Chris Finnegan, do the Pledge of Allegiance. So I'm thrilled to be hosting this for the fourth time. Uh, we really saw a need for our community to get to know the folks that are running for Board of Education, and I welcome all of you here tonight. Uh, this night is sponsored by the NJEA Pride uh, in Public Education Grant. We do many wonderful things in the community with these grants. We sponsored EB Day. We have our own, very own, uh, we call it Bears Necessity Clothing Den a gently used secondhand store for our students in need that we make sure we service them with. We also sponsor the holiday celebration, the gingerbread contest last year, many different uh, events throughout our community. And we're very excited to welcome all of you here tonight. We're grateful to the Parks and Recreation Department for the use of the community center. And I wanna give a very, very warm thank you to Adam Neary the executive producer, vice president of Playhouse 22 for sponsoring us and helping us with our needs tonight. I also want to give a very warm thank you to Dave Ambrosi, manager of EBTV and his crew for filming the event. This will be, yes. This will be rebroadcasted up until election day on EBTV and it is actually being live streamed right now on the EBTV Facebook page. Uh, the programs that you received tonight, beautiful programs, our office manager, Janine Morena, created them. I would like to thank her for that, and all of our volunteers that came out to assist with this. Now, for the most important part, our four guests of honor, running for three seats for the Board of Education, sitting in ballot order. First is Jeffrey Winston. Our second candidate is Denise Medford. Our third candidate, Vicki Becker. And our fourth candidate, Barbara Reese. The protocol for this evening is each of the candidates will be asked a series of questions. They'll have one minute and 30 seconds to answer the question, and each person will have an opportunity to go first in that order. At the end of our question series, each candidate will be able to give closing remarks and statement for two minutes. I would like to now introduce to you our moderator for this evening, Ms. Mary Beth Bikert, who is the Associate uh, Director of Government Relations for NJEA. Please give her a warm welcome, and I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you, Dana, and welcome, everyone, to tonight's event. Uh, we're glad you're here and that we can hear from our candidates who are really volunteering of their time on the benefit of our students and staff of the East Brunswick School District. So, as Dana said, we are going to get started with Mr. Winston. You are lucky enough to have the first question. <laughs> and that question is, what experience or training in education do you have that makes you qualified to run for a position on the Board of Education? If you are an incumbent, why should you be reelected? What is your vision for the students of East Brunswick and how will you use your position on the board to achieve that vision? Thank you very much for the, uh, for the question. And uh, first off, thank you very much to the EBEA uh, for arranging this event. And as you've heard, my name is Jeff Winston. I am seeking a second term with the Board of Ed. Now, three years ago, I ran as a new candidate to this incredibly responsible role. And among the many things I hope to get accomplished and initiatives I proposed, I'm very happy to say that many of them have been acted upon. As chair this year of the Finance Committee, uh, I used my professional skills as a financial consultant 
and brought that skill set uh, to the table and found that our finance committee here in this town is so incredible and uh, so well prepared and in many ways far surpasses those I've come in, uh, in contact with in the uh, public sector. Uh, what was not even a speck on the radar uh, was the daunting challenge we had to face as a district, a community, and a country that we would face in the way of COVID-19 virus. I know my, along with my fellow board members, staff, administration, students, and families all shared the paramount goal of keeping all of the children and staff safe while providing quality education, never compromising the standards we've come to expect in East Brunswick schools. Our board met weekly during last summer uh, and worked on strategies, implementing them in the virtual, hybrid, and eventual return to the classroom. I could never have anticipated this three years ago, but remain extremely proud uh, of this district and what I was able to accomplish along with my fellow board members in executing this incredible endeavor. Personally, I was raised in East Brunswick. I attended Warnsdorfer Churchill in the high school, graduating in 1980. My wife and children who are over there, all of which are East Brunswick grads or soon to be, uh, they participate in all of the things that kids do, and that is my end of my time. That is the end of your time. It was time. so much more exciting toward the end, <laughs> it really was. Thank you. All right. Miss Medford. Well, you were building up some steam there. It was good. Um, hi, everybody. It, it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited, happy about this. Um, what my experience has been over the last 25 years, I was in financial services. I got my start on Wall Street also, just like Jeff. But um, I've always loved school. I don't think the best day of the year was always the first day of school, going to school, the anticipation, the excitement, the things that you were going to learn. It was just like... You know, anything was possible. And what I bring to the table is the ability to, you know, just really bridge a lot of different types of people um, through the type of work that I did in the past and the type of work that I do now. Because people are legitimately afraid of change, right? So what I'm here for is, yeah, I am the new face. But you know what? Sometimes change is good. And sometimes it's okay to say, you know what, I'm not sure, but maybe get, you know, get to know what that person has to say because I have brought so much creativity to what I do and where I've been to the point where, yes, in New Jersey, I taught continuing education for insurance agents and trust me, a very dry subject. So these guys figured out that, you know what, my classes were fun and they were fun because I gave them an opportunity to share ideas and collaborate and really like, dive deeper into a subject that could traditionally be super dry. So I hope to bring that to the board so that the parents that I see, like people are here for a reason. This is a very big subject now. So people want to be heard, people want to be seen, and they want their kids to have the tools, right? So as I went through my career, I got a lot of tools, I got a lot of training, and I got a lot of education. And I was a you know self-propelled person, and I did a lot of home study myself. But um, I can't wait to learn more from these guys. I think this is a great opportunity. I'm Thank very you. excited to be Thanks here. Thanks very much. Okay, on to Ms. Becker. Good evening. Thank you again to the EBEA and to the Pride Committee for having us here tonight. I, who am I? I am a mother. I am a sister. I am a daughter, a loyal friend, a co-worker, a reliable co-worker. I am also a proud 21-year member of the East Brunswick Board of Education, and I think that's as much a part of my soul as the other things I listed. And with 21 years comes experience, an experience that I prefer to use as a resource, a toolkit, if you will, that I can pull out when I need it, an experience that allows me to expand upon the present and march into the future. But we never rest on our laurels here. Change is good. Reaching for the stars, raising the bar is good. Bring us best practices from other districts. Bring us initiatives. Bring them on. We learn from everyone every day. Don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Things work, but we're always happy to reach for the bar raise the bar, and reach for the stars. Thank you. Ms. Reese. Thank you to Dr. Zambicki, the EBA, the EBA Pride Committee, the Rec Department, EBTV, and Playhouse 22 for making this Meet the Candidates event possible. 
My name is Barbara Reese. I have lived in East Brunswick for 19 years with my husband, Larry. We have two children who proudly attend East Brunswick schools and are currently students at East Brunswick High School. In my life, I've always had a strong connection to the field of education. My mom was a high school Spanish teacher for 27 years, and my grandma Rose was an elementary school teacher for many years as well. I have a master's degree in education from New York University. I've worked as both a public and religious school teacher as well as a newspaper reporter. I'm honored by the prospect of continuing to serve as a member of the school board. I've served in a variety of school board committees, including as the chair of the special services, technology, and policy committees. During this past school year, our community has faced unprecedented health and economic challenges. Our board of education, administrators, teachers, and staff have worked tirelessly during the pandemic to ensure that our schools were ready to open safely. Our dedicated teachers, power professionals, nurses, counselors, and staff worked alongside our administrators to make sure our children had and continue to have the best possible educational experience during a worldwide pandemic. As both a board member and parent, I am forever grateful. I look forward to continuing to work with my fellow board members to support our students and staff in their transition to full-time in-person learning, as well as continuing to provide the critical tools they need to achieve these goals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reese. And we're going on to question two, and we're going to start with you, Ms. Medford. So I'm just gonna read the question. There's a couple of parts to it, so um, just take a moment. What is your vision for dealing with the increasing student enrollment in our schools in both the short and long term. How do you feel about the district restructuring plan which is being implemented next school year? Do you support building a new high school? Um, well, yeah, I mean, can you repeat that first part? <laughs> sure, the first part of the question is, how do you, um, and what is your vision for dealing with the increasing student enrollment in our schools in both the oh. long and short term? Well, I have to say, um, with the increase in student um, enrollment, for sure, since my son was in school, um, you know, there's been trailers, right? There was, uh, there's a lot of, we need more space. And I totally support the new high school being built. Um, I was here for the, for the mayor's uh, talk a little while ago, and he spoke about you know, the increase in housing and how that's going to affect our schools. And I think it's very important that you know, we have the space for these kids, and we have the room, and we have the means to do it. And I know that the taxpayers in this town, they get behind good reasons and good cause, but they want value you know, for their money, for what they're getting. And you know. I just feel that, you know, we have the, a great opportunity with redistricting. I mean, if that's going to happen, yes, we're going to have an increase in students. But, you know, we have a, an opportunity to share what we have here with the ones that are going to be redistricted. It's a great opportunity for us um, as well. So, you know, if we could just keep expanding on what we're doing and, you know, keep growing and showing everybody why East Brunswick is so good, why East Brunswick is Blue Ribbon and why we deserve the uh, the accolades that we have great thanks so much all right on to miss becker as a sitting board member i support the plan going into next year with what we're doing but let me make this clear the increase in enrollment is here now we have enough children in the district more children to almost open an entire elementary school we have run out of classroom space in all our elementary schools. That is why we are going to the plan we are next fall to open up space in the elementary schools, to create an upper elementary school in what is now the Hammerschold Middle School. We need to plan for the future now, but we are going to do it in conjunction with the parents, with the residents, the taxpayers, the students, the mayor and the town council. We are all going to figure out what our district needs to look like. But again, the increase in enrollment is here and we are dealing with it and I support what the board and administration is doing to deal with it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Becker. On to Ms. Reese. Building on what Ms. Becker said, uh, we're very fortunate that our district plans ahead. And so, you know, this is an issue that the mayor has brought to our attention. We've been 
planning in our efforts to make sure this whole that this is not something that we um, are behind. Uh, there, are, like we talked about earlier, there's a whole building worth of students that is coming to our town, and we welcome them. But but we have to plan properly so that the class sizes remain proper, and that each student gets the attention they need. We're very fortunate also that our finance department has worked with the town and to have shared services agreements so that the bonding is there for some of the uh, projects that we don't have to go out for referendum to make it a little more cost effective. So down the line, obviously we're gonna have to talk about the high school, about improve wh whether we want improvements to the high school, whether we want a new high school, and these are issues we will work with the community because it is a partnership between ourselves, the parents, and the government and municipal government as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Reese. And Mr. Winston? Uh, taking this in part, student enrollment. Student enrollment is up 157 net this year. Uh, that is, uh, for me, it was a little shocking when I heard that, but it certainly lends to some of the comments that were made at our classrooms are potentially uh, in a position to become overcrowded. Redistrict redistricting will address that issue, but this is where I disagree with a couple of my board members. This is not a new problem. Uh, I don't think we were proactive in its approach, and I think we had many years of warnings to address this, and we simply did not. When it comes to the high school, the uh, high school was built in 1957. Uh, there's a section of the high school that was built in 2001. I have a very difficult time justifying a build that took place 20 years ago and tearing it down. I certainly agree that parts of the high school are aged to the point, but I am not for an entire tear down of that entire property. I do not think it's responsible uh, to what was already been paid for in 2001 to create really, and if you haven't been in, I encourage you to visit, if you can, understanding the COVID protocol. It's a beautiful new section of the school. Uh, so. Uh, the new high school uh, I'm mixed on redistricting. It's been a long time. Uh, demographic shifts have, have occurred in this town. Populations have increased. We have something we hadn't seen 20 and 30 years ago of multi-generational families that have nor the, the n higher than normal average than what we've typically seen uh, in the past when I came up through the district. So yep, it's a necessary evil. We put ourselves in this position. Trailers are going to go in the back of one of the schools to house the students while we correct what wasn't addressed for really 10 to 15 years in the making. Thank you. And, <clears throat> excuse me. Ms. Becker, we're going to start our third question with you. Um, what contributions do you believe education support professionals, ESPs, make to student success, and how will you work to protect these employees from threats of privatization? The word support, it conjures up an image of literally holding something up. Our district is composed of many layers and we have an infrastructure and foundation. Our support staff, our power professionals, are so crucial to the infrastructure. What they do for our children every day to address perhaps an issue of, of, of an overcrowded classroom or the needs of a child, to help a teacher differentiate instruction. What I can do as a board member, along with the other board members to protect them, is to keep providing the kind of environment that cultivates growth, professional growth, professional development. We need to make sure all elements, all aspects of our staff feel that this is their district, that they are a partner in it with us, because we certainly feel that way about them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ms. Reese. Um, our power professionals, our education support professionals are really the lifeblood of any school building along with the teachers. Uh, basically, they are often the first face that the student sees when they walk in in the morning and the last face that they see at the end of the day. And without them, our schools wouldn't work. And what makes them so special is that they're East Brunswick 
uh, they work for East Brunswick, so it wouldn't be the same if they were. We don't we don't believe in pri at least I don't believe in privatizing, uh, and I'm sure most of the board would agree with that. Other paraprofessionals, they're just there's too important and too vital and they're part of the fabric of our community and similar to what Vicki said providing professional development providing them the supports that they need and in fact our district is offering um, you know all opportunities for professional development in a wider range of areas be post pandemic we did it before the pandemic and now there's specific ones related to issues uh, regarding the pandemic so thank you and and you know, m the main issue is that they are a key key portion of our of our uh, school uh, environment and what we stand for. It's not. Re I'm probably repeating myself, but <laughs> no. it's a it's a they're a vital part of our community. Thank you. Okay, and Mr. Winston. I, I disagree with nothing uh, that my uh, my co uh, board member said, but there is a part that was left out. Uh, from, a, from a simple and pragmatic perspective, I don't want privatization of any group or, or position within the schools that have direct uh, and constant interaction with our children. Uh, one area that I've seen privatized in other districts beyond the support staff, support staff is broader than just what we've mentioned. Uh, I look at the school security officers. Uh, I know that uh, the chair of our committee on the board, Mark Sismar, a highly decorated retired law enforcement officer, has uh, spoken about and which I agree strongly with that that is never a position that you want to lose controls of. Uh, the relationships that our uh, school security officers make with the children are impactful. Uh, they change lives just like the support staff that, that have been mentioned and the teachers. I would never privatize, I would never support privatizing uh, the, the school security, the general support staff, the in-classroom support staff, uh, or as I mentioned, anybody who has constant interactions with the children. Uh, privatization is a tough thing. Uh, I understand uh, that uh, having a partnership with the union helps in terms of managing and uh, setting the expectations and accountability standards, and that becomes a little challenging when uh, it's an outside entity which is managing that group. I am not for privatization of, again, positions that constantly and consistently interact with our kids. Thank you. Ms. Medford. Thank you. Um, I don't know where we would have been without the support staff um, when I went to school, when my son went to school. Um, they were so key. I think they enhanced his entire experience. I know that they enhanced mine. They were key people to me. Um, you know, and, and I really, I agree with everyone here that I don't think it should be um, privatized at all. I mean, if, I believe Vicki said, if it's not broke, why would we fix it? And I agree with that. So if, you know, we're looking at these people for, you know, their support in classroom, we have potentially an overcrowding situation that is forthcoming. As you said, for the last dozen years, we've been faced with this issue. So here we are, we have about a 12 to one ratio of, um, students to teachers, but those extra hands and all the, the, the specific needs of every single student in that class, you can't undervalue these people and what they bring to the table every single day from you know the main office to the powers to, to, to the security guards, like you mentioned. So this is just, you know, like you said, non-negotiable. Okay, thank you. So that was um, good to hear that we have a unanimous support of our ESPs. That's great to hear when we have board members, so thank you. Um, and Ms. Reese, we're gonna start with you for question number four. As a district returns to fully in-person instruction, there are many experiences, both good and bad, that will carry over from the time spent in hybrid and fully virtual instruction. How has the past year and a half affected your view of the role of technology in school? How has it shaped your view of the role of in-person interactions, socialization, and screen-free time? Okay. Just writing down the That's different fine. parts Take of your the time. question. <laughs> we won't start the clock yet. <laughs> okay. Well, as a former chair of the technology department and the technology committee, um, I feel very strongly of the role uh, that technology plays in the school system, but only in the right hands. So with the teachers, uh, working together with the students, that's what makes technology uh, a key force for learning. So from the educational side, 
we made a lot of things in virtual uh, learning possible. For example, my kids really benefited from OneNote. Uh, this allowed the students who are doing math to see what their teachers were actually doing in, on the board. It's similar to the idea of being on the board, so seeing the math problem worked out. It made a huge difference for them. Without the OneNote, I don't even know if they could have follow, you know, uh, done the kind of work that they did at the level that they did. But it's always the user that makes the technology uh, worthwhile. So without the expertise of the teachers who have taken the time and the effort, who I thank them for the training that they did to do this kind of thing, it makes the difference. The other part about being in person, though, now, now is the time to transition. So yes, screen-free time is important, interaction with one another, reacclimating to the building. We've had activities when they go to different new buildings, they get tours of the buildings. Uh, we've had uh, after school activities, they're starting their clubs again, the sports. So again, the teachers are helping the students come back into the buildings. Is there a role still for technology? Absolutely, but it has to be balanced. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Winston. Huge topic, uh, and, uh, and I think there's an unmentioned byproduct about what's gone on. Of course, the technology, we had the ability to turn on a dime, uh, get school reopened, great job technology department, and, and, and we say it all too often in our meetings. Uh, no doubt about some of the points made, but here, here's where my concern now lies, and I've been a very loud advocate of this. The byproduct of what we're going through and have been through over the last 19 months will ultimately result in the potential of a mental health issue not one of severity, but one that needs to be addressed, both amongst the staff, the students. These kids were locked down for a long time. Teachers in, in an overnight session went from teachers to engineers, sound engineers, lighting experts, uh, all of the things that go into producing a finely tuned lesson plan video-wise, and then they had to be the talent, and then they had to grade their own work. Let me tell you something, hats off to the teachers. I don't think I could have accomplished what they accomplished, and I think it was 72 hours. That said, uh, in-person interaction is vital, but I definitely want to see a reworking of the expectations from our guidance department in mitigating and handling the after effects of this virus on all involved, including the parents. Uh, I've seen the comments, I've seen the expectations, I've seen the anti-mask, you know what, stop it. This is for the kids. We are going too far, and we now need to address that, too, as part of the issue uh, in, in as we uh, reintegrate back into the new world that we live. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Medford. Okay. Um, as far as technology goes, in my own personal experience with my business, we um, were shut down for several months. Um, we ran our business via, you know, um, Zoom, right? Everything was Zoom, and then it became hybrid. And I, you really can't underestimate the value of, you know, being able to reach the students. I think it's an amazing tool that we have, but it has to have its place in the classroom. I did look at some of these modules that they are using in the classrooms, and they're fascinating. It's it's amazing what we can do and how we can reach the students. But at the end of the day. They have been so isolated and so not, not socialized. Um, it's just become its own pandemic. You know, the depression, the rates are going up. And that's where it becomes even more important to have these support staff peop, you know, in the schools so that they can address this. They're right, the teachers are being therapists. They are wearing so many hats. And that's what I had to do with my business as well, was figure out the lighting, figure out the microphones, figure out all this stuff, and then figure out your plan for the day and what are you going to do with these folks. So it becomes ever more important that, you know, we have our support staff there for the for the students and keep that technology going but in the in the right way. Um, I think that as we integrate them back in, I would like to see, you know, less and less online and more and more hands on because you can't underestimate the interaction and the socialization that a school can bring when kids learn how to uh, communicate with each other and how they're going to, you know, face the world Thank as they you. grow up. Thank you very much. Ms. Becker. No remote session could ever replace being physically present in a classroom with a teacher and your fellow students. We didn't have a choice. 
And to say we made the best of it is an understatement and would be a disservice, particularly to a lot of the people in this room. Our staff, of course, parents. I had a parent call me up and say, oh my God, I thought I'd never have to look at high school algebra again. <laughs> she was just devastated. She said, I, how do I do it? How do I figure out how to work and, and, and also be a tutor to my kid? And they did. And all of you who are parents did. And I don't know how you did it, but however you did, it was fantastic. The role of technology in our lives is, we may not, we may think of it sometimes as an interference. We may think of it sometimes as a barrier, but it's integrated into everything we're going to do. The pandemic has changed our world. It's also changed the world our children are going to live in. But we must prepare them to take their place in a 21st century world that does rely on technology. We have the means to use it and to teach it properly and responsibly. It is a tool. It is not the way to teach. It is not the curriculum. But it is a tool they must know how to use. Thank you. Thank you. So we're ready to go into our second round of questions. But if everybody would like to just I'm take. Sorry, we're getting ready to go into our second round of questions. So if everybody would just like to take a deep breath, maybe a sip of water, and we'll get started. Mr. Winston, what is your position on integrating students with special needs and general education students socially, emotionally, and within the extracurricular activities in the district? Yeah, prior to tonight, uh, I, I had a cloudy view of this. So, so what I've always been a believer of is I don't have all of the ideas, but I do believe collectively that you could put together a consortium that would. I reached out to Audrey Weiner, who is, uh, if you don't, those who don't know, is an incredible advocate in this community for special needs, and she really enlightened me. And for that, I've taken on exactly what her platform is. Simply put, I believe every student in this district, regardless of need, has a right to enjoy the educational experience as any other student. I believe in inclusion. I don't believe in ex exclusion. I don't believe that any child is predestined uh, to take on a certain role as opposed to others, nor should they be relegated to the back row for any reason. That is not what this district is now. That's not what this district ever has been. And I, again, I'll reiterate, uh, separation like, uh, like that is, you know, in most cases unnecessary. As far as integration and mainstreaming all children together, where appropriate, with the support staff that was mentioned, it is something that could be achieved. Uh, you have to use all of the resources that would be given to us. Our support staff is strong. The classroom contains any aids that are necessary, and the purpose of that is not to segregate that child, but to integrate them into the full life experience that the education offers here in East Brunswick. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Medford. Oh, thank you. Um, I had the privilege of having um, a man with autism in my um, business. And uh, I, for those of you that don't know, I run a fitness center. And um, he would come with his, with his mother and take the classes with her. And his contribution to that class could not have been underestimated or even expected, right? He was an amazing contribution to that class. He gave people inspiration, he gave people hope, and he received a lot of love from them. And I believe that it helped him with his development. I worked very closely with the Arc of Ocean chapter and have done a lot of fundraising with them and got to know how those programs work and, and how important inclusion is for them. So whether they're in school or once they integrate themselves outside of school, you can't underestimate their contributions, whether it's a physical disability or a mental disability. Uh, you know, these people need and deserve to be included in the programs, and I feel that their contributions, it's a give and take, it's very reciprocal, and the benefits are, are, are very mutual, and it would be an amazing thing. It would be actually horrible to try and segregate these people um, out of the classroom, and I totally support, I support it. Great. Ms. Becker. Least restrictive environment. This district has been committed 
to bringing as many programs in-house as we can. Not just because it saves money, because it does. We don't have to spend the exorbitant rates on added district placements, but because it's the best environment for special needs children to be in their home school, to be with their fellow students. Jeff, I'm so glad that you had the opportunity to speak with Audrey. It's parents like Audrey and others that I have talked to over the years who've told me their stories and how they wanted their children they wanted their children to, to go to the birthday parties. They wanted their children to go to the clubs. They wanted their children to go to the, the field day and school assemblies to be a part of our community. And there's no reason for them not to be. We have an amazing, amazing special education department. And we totally support the idea of bringing as many programs in-house as possible and not sending children out of district. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Reese. Uh, I echo the sentiments that we've heard here. We have some of the finest uh, special education teachers and paraprofessionals in the state. Uh, when families move to East Brunswick, many move here because of the programs and the teachers that we have here in East Brunswick. Uh, our special services uh, committee, for which I chaired for some time, it's a key uh, issue that we try to involve the parents like like Audrey in in the whole process uh, she she actually when I was uh, volunteering for EBTV I toured disability allies which is a program that she put together with some other folks to help the students who transition to adulthood to have the skills that they need and that's something we do here in East Brunswick as well we help them to uh, figure out housing um, uh, to figure, oh, yes, to figure out that transition to adulthood. So that's another area that we're continuing to work on. And, you know, honestly, the, the, we're very fortunate that we even have Buddy Ball. Uh, we have volunteers in town, like Howie Alexander and John Alba, and my uh, son and many other kids in this room. I, I, I'm pretty sure even some board members have their kids uh, volunteering for Buddy Ball so that students who have special needs can enjoy uh, the sports with their peers and with uh, students from other parts of the school and have a special day just for them. So thank you, and this work always continues. Great, thank you very much. Our next question uh, goes to Ms. Medford. You'll start it off. Given the diversity of our town's population, how could you support diversity and equality initiatives? Well, considering our diversity in this town is about 50%, um, you know, 50% of our population in the schools are considered minority. Um, how would I support equality in the... Equality and diversity initiatives. Well, how would I support them? I would, you know, make sure that I took a look at, like, look, we all know I'm the new guy up here. There are things that I don't know. Where I'm sitting here with an experienced panel. So there, for me to speak on how I would do it without understanding the program, it would be complicated for me to answer that appropriately. So what I would say is, if given the opportunity, I would take a look a lot closer and see where we have some gaps, see where we have opportunities, and try to fill them in. And maybe bridge you know, some areas that we haven't addressed. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really how I would, I would approach it. I would learn from the people around me, and that's something that I'm good at. I'm very good at listening, I'm a quick learner, and you know what, I would see what's being done, what has been done, and see where we can uh, move on from there. Thank you very much. Ms. Becker. We want to encourage a safe, welcoming environment, inclusive of all students. Somebody said something to me recently, and I really thought it was, it was beautiful. She said, we want each child to see themselves in the curriculum. I think that says it all. And that's what we strive to do. We uphold the state mandate, diversity and inclusion in our curriculum, but we didn't need a state mandate to tell us to create an environment where all children see themselves in the curriculum. 
where children feel safe, feel comfortable, being who they are. There's a beauty in every child. It's our responsibility as educators to nurture that beauty, and we do it through clubs. We have clubs, we have more clubs than any other district in this state. We have more electives in our high school than almost any other district in this state that go into and support the diversity and culture of our students. I'm very proud of what we're doing, but that doesn't mean we can't do more. We can always do more. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rees. Well, I'm, I'm going to be echoing some of Ms. Becker's statements here as well. Honestly, this is a top priority of our district. We strive to include students of all backgrounds, ethnicities, races, genders, in meaningful activities. That's part of the education of the whole child. And, in, and part of that is having the activities in school that make you feel proud of your background. And similarly to what was just said, we have a variety of clubs at the high school that, for example, International Culture Club, there's Clash of the Cultures. So that's where the students who are in that club, each representing their particular ethnicity or background, they have dances, foods, I've attended, it's beautiful. And so kids learn from other kids about their background and their life and their foods and their holidays. And it makes for an environment where people just are happy to get to know more about one another and understand each other. And our teachers are also involved, again, in many electives in the history department, uh, in, in all different areas of learning that allow the students to explore and to make their own critical judgments about things that are going on in the world. So I feel very proud of that and it makes our, it makes our educational system that much richer to have that diversity in, in our school system. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Winston. You know, I anticipated this question a couple of days ago, and I was giving it a lot of thought. And I thought about the last 42 years since I graduated from East Brunswick High School, and back when I went, we had four African Americans and three folks from India, uh, and it's certainly changed since then. But what hasn't changed, what hasn't changed, and where this question implies is that we have an issue that needs to be addressed, and this is my interpretation of, of this thing that needs to be addressed when it comes to diversity and uh, equality. East Brunswick has never had, ever, in my entire time here, a systemic problem with any of the things that other towns are experiencing in other states and other places. I, can, I attribute all of that to the administration, the staff, and especially the students. I've got uh, two students in the high school, uh, where are the other ones, honey? Uh, two in Churchill, and, and, uh, and, and they've been through all the other schools. You know, not one time has any of them come back to me with a story of that. Yeah, there are isolated incidents, and we have addressed them, but quite frankly, we don't have this problem. We simply don't have this problem in this town. I have heard individual stories. It's not systemic. I do believe that we're doing a fine job, and I watch the evolution of our teachers as they address it based on what Ms. Reese said in terms of curriculum, redesigning certain parts of the curriculum. We're not fixing a problem. We're just making what we've already done great, greater, perhaps through communication, but we are fixing nothing. It's not broken. Great, thank you very much. All right, Ms. Becker, we're gonna start the next question with you. What about the East Brunswick School District are you most proud of? Conversely, what improvement do you see as the biggest opportunity for our students? I'm sorry, could you repeat the Absolutely. first part of the question? Sure. What about the East Brunswick School District are you most proud of? Conversely, what improvement do you see as the biggest opportunity for our students? I don't think it would be possible for me to pick one thing to be most proud of. What I am most proud of is when I'm driving to work in the morning and I see kids waiting at the bus stop, eager to get to school. When I visit a school and I see teachers in the classroom warmly greeting their students, students raising their hands in the air, filling the halls with joyous noise, 
going to sports games, going to concerts. All of this fills me with pride every single day. I'm proud of the fact that as a community, we provide our children a model for respect, for understanding, for tolerance, modeled by our teachers, our parents, our government, what we need to improve, we should never settle. We should never say, oh, we, we, it's OK to be mediocre. Our, our motto is not mediocrity in the arts, athletics, and academics. But excellence is not just to be achieved or maintained. Excellence is constantly needed to move forward, to change, to strive for different things. I guess I'm proud of everything. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Reese. So the most proud of part, I would say, is the guidance department, the college planning department, <coughs> specifically though post-pandemic, uh, the student services area, where we have our counselors have, and teachers really also as well, have offered so many programs. I sat down to make a list of all the different groups and all the different uh, parent supports and how the communities work together. So for example, from talking about need-based support groups, how they have a coping skills group, an anxiety relief group, a new student group. There's um, f uh, parent support groups for student wellness. There, there's enrichment opportunities so for kids who fell behind in their schoolwork because of the pandemic. They have credit recovery programs so that they can make up the programs. Let's say they were close to failing. They helped them so they didn't fail the subject. So these kind of services you don't find everywhere. But I also want to mention that the communities involved too, like the EBA Bear Den, like the Mayor's Council where, where they have collect charity for those in need. Area of improvement, there always is an area for improvement. I would say transitions between the schools. Uh, we've been working on that. Um, you, for example, if you're going into Hammershold or going into the high school or going into Churchill. So for example, to help those students coming from the elementary to Hammershold, they started to have lessons so that they can prepare them for the school and for the rigor of the next level. So my time is up, but yes, I can tell you more Thank you. time. Thank you, Ms. Reese, <laughs> and to Mr. Winston. Everything Barb said. Now, the, um, <laughs> now what I, some of the other things that I'm most proud of, I'm extremely proud of the student staff resilience through uh, coming through this pandemic. Uh, Barbara mentioned it, I love the Bear Den. Uh, the Bear Den is the energy. Yep. The uh, Bear Den goes right down to the core of what it is to be Friday Night Lights high school student. I'm really proud of the overall energy of our students right now. You know, East Brunswick's an unusual thing. People who graduate from East Brunswick tend to keep these relationships for life. But many of my friends around the country, when I talk to them, I ask them about their high school friends and they have none. It's a very interesting dynamic here in our town. And I, and, and I give a lot of that to the teachers. The teachers do weave a fabric where students do bond together in a very unusual way. Uh, a good way, but unusual. And I like that. Uh, I'm living it. Uh, in terms of improvement, we have to step up our 21st century readiness in terms of education. Uh, technology is there. I believe we've started to build the backbone, but I think it goes further than that. It's definitely my hope that in, in some day soon we stop carrying textbooks and keep everything uh, electronic. Uh, it's breaking these kids' backs. I watch what my kids carry around, and my God, it, it, it's, it's incredible. I'm surprised their legs aren't stronger, quite frankly. It, it, it's, it's just awesome uh, how well they do. And the last thing I'd like to see us improve on is, is while things are good, we can't settle for a Blue Ribbon District. That bar always has, the expectations must be higher, accountability must be there, and we must always never settle for where we're at if we want to maintain this high level of status. Thank you very much. You're and Ms. Medford, you get to close out this question. Okay. Um, you know, for me, I moved here for the East Brunswick schools, um, and I was very proud that my son went through um, through Hammershold all the way up through high school. And um, I, I believe that he got every tool he needed to be successful and I couldn't be prouder of who he has become. 
Um, I think the thing that I enjoy the most that makes me proud is on Sundays when I hear the marching band playing at the football field and I can hear that. I was in the marching band. I know it's kind of, <laughs> yeah, but I was. And uh, I, I don't, well, right. don't be <laughs> jealous, no, no. but uh, it, was, it was a fantastic experience. And I see that that experience is still ongoing at, at, the, at the school level, at every school level. And I enjoy seeing the kids with the signs and the car washes and there's so much immense pride in their school and the system and their bonds that they have with each other. Um, where I see some room for improvement, and I've got to be honest, I mean, this might not be a technology issue, but the lunch menus, the menus are just uh, in some serious need of improvement. I believe that our children need more than uh, a diet of processed foods and sugars, and, um, you know, I just took a look, and I think that there's some opportunities that we have to work with our current provider to you know, give them more whole foods and give them the basis for a healthier lifestyle because kids are faced with a pandemic, an, an epidemic of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and these kids, and it's a big, big problem. And I know this might not be related to a technology question, but I do believe that that's an area for improvement, and I would love to see something change, and I would be happy to take ownership of All something right. like that. Well, thank you very much. Ms. Reese, we're going to start you off with our last formal question, and that is, if you are elected to serve on the school board on November 2nd, 2021, what are your top priorities for our district? How will you work to achieve those priorities? Hmm. That's my closing question. All right, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll revamp. Uh, the number one priority for myself is to make sure that, and I'm sure for all our board members, is to make sure that the school system is safe and healthy and welcoming for our students. It has been a, uh, a rough 18 months, and it is uh, a time period that no one could have forecasted, and our main priority is to make sure those students transition properly back into in-person learning, have the social and emotional supports that they need to do well in school, to provide them the proper academics that they need if they are behind to help them make, you know, come back from where they've been. And I also believe strongly in that the technology that we provide and building on what we said before is providing them for jobs, jobs for our students that we don't even know exist right now. Uh, artificial intelligence, many other areas that we haven't explored. So I think that the pandemic opened the door for that, for the kids to be more comfortable with that. I've spearheaded coding to have that in the after school programs. I think that's an area of opportunity that our students enjoy and is important for us. But really the number one priority for me is, is to make sure that they have the proper guidance, the proper support that they need to be successful once again in in-person schooling. Great, thank you. And Mr. Winston. First priority is gonna remain just what it is for everybody on this panel right now. It's going to be the safety of our students as we transition back to real life and a, uh, a virus, hopefully free life. Uh, an area of concern of mine that I want to address in this term is our math program. Uh, I've had multiple presentations made to the board. I've, shown, I've been given no recommendations and no impl uh, implementation. Uh, from the administration, uh, everyday math, the numbers don't lie. I'm a finance guy, everything is analytical. It hasn't worked and there's been no solution brought forward that has been recommended for implementation and it's far too long for that change to take place. I do know it's time to expand the responsibilities and expectations of our guidance department as it addresses, again, coming out of this very unusual circumstance that could leave lasting effects if not mitigated on the folks who see your kids longer than probably you do on a daily basis, and that's in the school. Uh, I do uh, believe that teachers need to have professional development programs to recognize certain signs from students who may uh, not be coming forward, which many won't, who are struggling with situations that perhaps arose as a result of this pandemic and maybe too much closeness at home or with siblings. And uh, lastly, uh, I've heard recent presentations, and I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes in terms of an alternative path to those students who decide perhaps college isn't in their immediate future and that we could provide the training necessary for them 
and uh, the, the job skills, interview skills, so they can actually launch also without college being the only path to success. Thank you very much. Sure. Ms. Medford. Okay. So, um, of course, a top priority is transitioning back into school that makes sure that everybody is safe and everybody has what they need. But I believe a top priority is also to get back to basics. I think that there's a benefit for uh, fundamentals. Um, I always used to tell my son when he was playing basketball, everybody wants to do the jump shots, everybody wants to dunk, but nobody wants to learn the fundamentals. And I believe that there's an opportunity with what I, did, what I mentioned about the uh, lunch program is that we can incorporate um, with Whole Foods a gardening program. And I think there's an immense benefit to being able to get your hands dirty and learn life skills. There's nothing um, more gratifying than raising your own food, being self-sufficient, learning those community skills that someone would need in order to, to do that. And I think that we have an opportunity where we can make some adjustments, we can make some changes. And it's not just about what's on the lunch plate, but it's about all those other things that you learn. Gardening has so many other benefits um, to it. It's not just growing something, it's nurturing it, it's, it's, it's working with others, it's you know meditative, it's all these other things. And I would really love to see the parents getting involved with that and getting the parents back to the PTA meetings, getting the parents back to the Board of Ed meetings and seeing more enthusiasm for what we're doing. And I was you know really excited to be, to be here tonight and really excited for this, but I feel like you know, the more inclusion that we have, the more parents that we get involved, the more people we see here next time is going to just keep continuing to fuel people to just want to do more and get more excited and enthusiastic about this program. And I think it's great, but this is a place where we can make some great. improvements. Thank you very much. And Ms. Becker. In no particular order, there is an over-reliance of funding public education through property taxes in this state. I know that's a shocker to all of you, but um, our property taxes are the highest in the country, I believe. Maybe the second highest. That's not a distinction that I'm happy about. And we need to keep in mind as board members that fiscal responsibility isn't just once a year when we approve a budget. It is every single day where we question a $5 line item as much as we question a $5 million line item because it is the taxpayer's money we are entrusted of. With, we need to do a better job communication. We give out a lot of information, but I'm not convinced that we give out the information that people need, that our staff needs, that our parents need. We need to come up with better ways of delivering that information. There are so many ways available. But sometimes I feel that the messages aren't getting out there and we need to figure out why. I believe that we need to always consider the social emotional health of our children, which is why our arts program is so crucial, which is why our athletics program is so crucial. I think we have a lot of work to do, but I think we have people who are willing to roll up their sleeves and come together as a town with all stakeholders and do it for the kids. Thank you. Thank you. So to close out our evening, we wanna thank you and on behalf of the East Brunswick Education Association, uh, we wanna thank you for volunteering your time and really um, modeling good civic responsibility. Um, but uh, the last two minutes are going to be devoted to your words and what you want this audience to know about you as we close out the evening. So if there's anything you'd like to clarify or expand upon or just share with the audience, you now have two minutes each to do that. And Mr. Winston, we start with you again. I'm not gonna regurgitate everything that we talked about tonight, so I'm just gonna add really why. Uh, I take an enormous amount of pride of recognizing this position as elected by the people, and I make myself available and approachable, as many of you know uh, that I've seen in this room. Uh, I don't hide, uh, I'm here, I listen, and I act. Uh, I ask the big questions. I, I am, <laughs> you will never add rubber stamper to my name. Uh, fellow board members, should they so, so choose to share, would know that it's not an easy cut with me. 
uh, on that board. I hold people accountable. I dig for all of the information before uh, accepting things at face value. And I think that's what the community wants. When it comes to fiscal responsibility, has been mentioned earlier, I walk that walk. I fight every dollar, every dollar that comes across our desk. And if it's wasteful, I will call it out. All too often, I will lose that vote six to three on this board. But you know what? I need to be on this board. I need to be a part of this. And I remain vocal and share the results of things that people don't say because the board mem the meetings are not attended. I get that. That's OK. You don't have to come. Just ask me. I will tell you everything that happened that, uh, in that public session. And in my opinion, representing only me, I will tell you what the results of that would be. Skin in the game, I've got tons of it. Uh, five kids, uh, one of which left the system. I'm here. Uh, I, have, I have a pulse on this district. I love this town. I love this town a lot. I hate the political signs. The political signs have turned into an image of hate in this town. And as a result, I'll be removing all of my signs this weekend. If you believe in what I'm doing, you're my signs. Tell your neighbors, tell your friends. I don't need to be hanging out on the corner or somewhere in the medium of Riders Lane. I think my actions and my performance for the last three years speak clearly. I hope you believe that too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Medford. Well, thank you, thank you. This has been um, quite an experience getting ready for this conversation with everyone. And um, I'm a hard worker and um, I, I actually did a survey of, of the community and I sent it out and I got responses and I was more than more than a little impressed with the answers that we got. And um, they really are looking for somebody to listen. They're looking for somebody that can implement change. They're looking for someone that doesn't sit in an ivory tower, that maybe gives them a reason to show up. And you know, I love to figure out ways to make something that's not so great better. And that's one of my strengths, talking, communicating, working with the team, you know, I was um, a, a swimmer as a, as a kid, and that was a very individual sport. And it was a team sport at the same time. So can you work as an individual? Can you work as a team? These are the types of things that, you know, I bring to the table is that I can do both. I can work on my own. I can be self-motivated and propelled, but I can work well in a group and listen to other people and what they have to say. I'm not closed-minded. I'm not shut down about anybody's opinions or what they have to say. If you took a look at my family, you would know that everybody in my family is from some part of the world. And um, I think that in my own family, the diversity that we have has brought us to this point where my culture and how I grew up makes me want to do more service, makes me want to be active in the community. And it's just something that I was raised with. It was a pride in my family. My father was, uh, was an amazing guy, and um, he passed away from brain cancer, but he was never negative. He was never not a guy that I couldn't look up to, and he was a hero. And I feel like I could be that person for someone to, in, this, in, this, in this community to, to look up to and say, you know what, thank you for helping me. Thank you for helping my kids, and thank you for being a part of this. And that's really all I have to say, and I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you very much. Ms. Becker. I'm so glad Jeff mentioned about not being a rubber stamp, because he's in very good company. Our board is not there to rubber stamp. I have served on this board when we decided to televise board meetings. Yes, there was a time when board meetings weren't televised. I feel like it's telling my kids, yes, there was a time when we didn't have cell phones, but board meetings weren't televised when I first got on the board. And we worked very hard, a bunch of us, to get them televised because we believed in being transparent. We wanted to encourage the community to be a part of things. Look, I've been on every board committee. I've chaired every board committee. I've been president of the board for three years. I've been vice president before that for years. I love doing this. It's a part of who I am. It's been a privilege to do this. It's been a privilege to be part of a group that seeks consensus because no individual board member can do anything on their own. 
We must work together as a team, and it is only through consensus. It is only through a majority of the board members voting on something that change gets accomplished. I don't think one day has gone by in 21 years that a resident hasn't called me, whether it's a parent, a student, a senior citizen, a young couple moving into the district without children, called me for advice, to talk, to complain, sometimes to compliment, mostly to complain, but to reach out, and I have been there, and I want to continue being there. Again, it has been my privilege to serve, and I hope I have the support to continue that privilege of sharing and serving with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Medford, and uh, Ms. Becker, and Ms. Reese. You're going to end the evening for us. There's some advantages to being last on the ballot. Yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, a quick nod to the EBF. I forgot to mention we were talking about community partners. And um, yeah. they've donated $2.5 million in grants since 1993. So I just want to thank them for that. Thank you to the EBA and the Community Arts Center for hosting us tonight. I would be honored to continue to serve on the Board of Education because I believe in our East Brunswick school system. We are consistently rated one of the top performing school systems in the state and our district teachers and staff are always looking for ways to improve upon our already top-notch schools. We believe in excellence in the academics, athletics, and the arts. I'm most proud of what our students are doing after they graduate. Whatever they choose, area they choose to pursue, college, the military, the workforce, they're doing well. These alumni are telling us how prepared they are, often more prepared than their peers from other school districts. I was fortunate that both my parents believed that education would be their kid's ticket to a successful life. My mom was a high school Spanish teacher for 27 years. My father emigrated from Argentina in the 1950s and learned to speak English at night school. He worked long hours in an electrical supply warehouse for many years. Unfortunately, earlier this year, my father passed away from COVID. One of his proudest moments, I wasn't gonna cry, was when he was recognized for being a 55-year member of the IBEW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. He often worked overtime so that we would have enough money for extracurricular activities. My mom also worked a second job as a community college teacher they both valued hard work and education. It is that strong belief that continues to motivate me to work towards helping to ensure that all students have the opportunity to receive a high quality public school education here in East Brunswick. I hope to continue to be a part of the East Brunswick educational system that provides our children the access to the tools they need to live successful and rewarding professional lives. Thank you. Well, thank you all, and on behalf of the East Brunswick Education Association, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you, everyone, for coming out and joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.